Hello, my name is Meredith Kutz, the Professional Development Associate here at NACE. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Ahead of the Curve, Driving Early Student Engagement for Optimal Outcomes. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Thomas Iwinko, Alumni and Career Development Executive from First Hand, an info-based company. Take it away. Thank you, Meredith, and thank you everyone for joining me today. I'm excited to be here. I remember a few months ago when I was sitting at my desk and I got a, a message from one of our, my directors and said, hey, we're gonna have you do a, a presentation uh, for NACE. I'm like, great, love to go to the conference, love to be there in person, wonderful thing. And then I find out, nope, it's in two months and you're doing it virtually. So a little change of pace, sped things up a little bit, but I'm excited. This is such a great thing to do. And I'm, I've always watched these uh, over the past few years as I've been a member of Career Services and been in this, in this field. And so I'm delighted to be here. A little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Dr. Thomas Iwanko. I've been in higher education for almost 20 years now. I've done a little bit of everything. So came up from the admissions ranks and did a lot with admissions, moved into enrollment management, did career services, strategic planning, uh, grants writing, teaching social justice, a little bit of everything. Uh, but for the past few years, I've been with uh, Ruffalo No Levitt's working with their career services, and they've came on to InfoBase and firsthand recently to help them with career and alumni services. Um, and so I'm glad to be here. I hope to say that you learned something, take something out of the presentation we'll be giving to you, and uh, we go from there. What I want to talk about and some of the things we'll be going over today, I'm going to click here, is what do we know currently within this space? Where are we at? Uh, what's upcoming? What is the data showing us within the space of career services and more importantly, higher education and where we're at? Talk about career services and engagement and really just putting it all together. What are some of those early participation keys that we need to look for that we can implement and put into the system to create this engagement. Something we're all looking for, something we're trying to get and improve at all of our schools, all throughout. And I know that from the many schools I've talked to, the people I've worked with, uh, we wanna always increase the engagement. We know in increased engagement increases retention, increases graduation rate, increases success, increases buy-in for everything from our students who become alumni. And I'm gonna end up with talking about our campuses. What are some of those key resources we already have on campuses that we, can, that we can tone into? We can unlock those resources to help our current students really succeed and help us in what we do in the market. Because that's what we really wanna do. We wanna make sure that we are working with our students, providing them with the best services they can. They're using the resources and services we have so when they graduate, they have that job lined up and they wanna give back. We know how this works. And so this is what we're gonna be talking about today. We have now about 45 minutes to talk. We will get into some questions and answers as we go through. But I wanna change gears for a second. I, wanna, I want us to think about something different. We're always talking about higher education. We work in this field. We're talking about career services, alumni, student success. Those are the big words, the big things we're talking about. I want, to, I want us to think about something in a different way. Go on a completely different path. I know everyone here and almost everyone has gone to college. You have a degree. Some of you have advanced degrees, okay? We've went through this process. We know what college is like and attending and being a student is like. Some of us are recent graduates. Some of us have been in the field for many years. So think about that for yourself. I'll use myself as a good example. I've been in this space for a long time. I know the lingo. I know what the resources are. I know where the resources are. So let me take it a step back and change. I know, and we can ask this question, I'm not gonna go for a poll, but if I asked you, are you gonna buy a house sometime in your life? So if I asked you when you were a 20-year-old graduating from college or whenever you graduate from college, if you were going to buy a house, I would bet that almost 
90 plus percent of you said, yes, I'm going to buy a house. Some of you might say I'm going to rent a house, but buying a house is something we all just expect to do. Okay. So maybe 20 some years ago, I was newlywed looking to buy a house. So what do you do? What did I do? What do a lot of people do? Oh, look, there's an open house down the corner. Let me walk into that house and see what the house looks like. I remember back then you had to actually get the Sunday paper or the Saturday paper and look, open houses are coming at these times and you just randomly would show up, look at the houses and see if you liked it. It wasn't until maybe the third or fourth house that I walked into that the real estate agent there said, hey, how are you? Started a conversation, asked me, are you pre-qualified? Are you working with an agent? Are you doing this? Are you doing that? I looked at her with this dumbfounded face. No, I'm just here to look at houses and buy one. And her response was, well, <laughs> let's meet on Tuesday at seven o'clock. We'll go through the process with you. Bring this paperwork and let me get started. Then I can send you searches and do this. That can really get you prepared. Okay. But let's, let's take that little example. Let's, let's just go 20 years in the future to today. I mean, today you can't even see a house without getting pre-qualified. You can't even bid on a house without having a pre-approval. Yes, there's a pre-qualification, there's a pre-approval. Then there's all these other steps. And think about it. Back in the day, applying for a house, getting a house, was you just put the offer in and chances are you were the only offer in or maybe there's one other offer and they would go back and forth with you and get something. Today, there's delayed negotiations. There's escalation clauses going on right now. And houses are going for thousands over the price. I had a friend just the other day who tried to get a house. They had to scramble at the last second because their agent didn't do escalation clauses. So they had to get a new agent, do escalation clauses, do all this stuff. It was stress. It was panicking. It was all last second. So why am I saying this? Why am I talking about houses? Twenty years ago, when I started in admissions, and I met with students, and they came up to my table, and I started talking to them about the school I was at. What they would say to me was, "Oh, I'm looking for you know this major, but you know what we really talked about was what was the the residence house would look like." what you did and the activities, what the experience was at the school. And then once they were interested in that, we talked about the major and the classes they would take in the faculty. I can tell you it was rare when a parent or a student said to me, so what's the job placement like? Or where do their graduates work? Now I can say this and I can say this probably at almost every school that's on here, they probably has the same exact answer to this question. Right now we can say, Probably 90 to 95% of our students have found jobs within six months of graduating. We know that. It happens in almost every school. A little asterisk behind that says, we don't know what major they're in or if they correlate with a major, but they have found jobs. Well, think about today. The recent data is showing us the students nowadays at 88% rent rate are choosing to go to college to get a job. It's no longer just because the, this is the continuation of high school. Because that's what it was. It was the continuation of high school, just the natural progression, go to college or go to work. So I went to college to continue that. And it wasn't until the fourth year when they're ready to graduate, they're like, oh, I got to get a job. We're seeing that shift. And the shift that's been happening over the past 10 years and so greater now. These students are going to college to get a job. Even more so, this came out about two years ago, right before the pandemic hit. And I love this stat. 72% of students chose career outcomes as the number one reason for choosing to attend the private college they did. It was tied with the academic program, but it was tied for number one. That's why they chose that school. That was unheard of back in the day. Major, the experiences, other things were there. But that was it. They chose that school because of the uh, career outcomes that were coming in. 
And we know and we see in the stats and the data how the fluctuation has happened with enrollments at schools. We know that. Private colleges, they typically are stable most of the time because of just who they are. Public colleges go up and down a little bit. and Community colleges drastically change. We see that. I mean, think about when the, the bubble burst about 10 years ago. You saw the community colleges spike in enrollments. And then you see now, between now and then, you saw them decline greatly. Now there's resources were put into the schools because they needed it. Now the enrollments are down. But it all comes back to this. The job is the reason they're coming to the school. Then there's this. This is really big. So I just came from Ruffalo Noel Evans. We do a lot of research there. One of the surveys we sent out, we asked students to tell us their perceptions. And this is the big thing. Remember, this is their perceptions. When we asked them of their perceptions of what they're getting out of career services and what they need from career services, we found a 30% gap between what they wanted and what they were getting. Now, mind you, I'm going to put this, this caveat here. I can know for a fact, everyone on here, I can almost guarantee you've got the resources available to your students that they're wanting. You've got those resources available to them. But that's not the point. Okay. You have the resources available. They don't know. Or they don't know where to get them. Or how to access them or how to get there, or they might be looking in the wrong spot. So they perceive this gap of between what they're getting and what they need. And it's a big gap. And then the last thing I'd like to throw out there is because I, I, I see all these schools and we, we hear this, 96% of schools are deciding they want improving outcomes as a goal. Yes, I think every school says that. We know how the lingo goes. I'm very blunt sometimes. We know how the lingo goes with the higher ups. I was a senior vice president. We know how it goes. But is that what the resources are being put for us? And are you seeing that? That's a whole other discussion in a way. But the schools and the states are even saying now they want to see more career outcomes. We've seen this over the past five, 10 years. We want to see career outcomes coming in. So the resources need to be there. So with that data, with all that's going on, let me, let me share a couple of things here. And, um, Actually, at this point, uh, Meredith, if you don't mind, I want to throw out that survey, um, that first survey we want to go and get some interaction with everyone. Um, quick interaction here. Approximately what percentage of your students engage with your career center on an annual basis? And be honest. If you have 100%, that is wonderful. I'm going to have, I'm going to, I want you to call me personally. I want to figure out what you're doing because I love to share how you get that 100%. Um, but we're looking at this. And we see the poll going on. I, I see the questions coming here. I asked this question for, for a very purpose, purposeful reason. And I worked at a, a career center. I worked at a college as a, a vice president. I remember when our budgets were being, being cut because of enrollment and things that were going on, one of the first centers to be cut was career services. I've been in this space now for multiple years. That's been one of the first things I've been hearing from departments. Well, our budget's been cut or, or shut down a little bit. So I'm going to end the poll here. Sharing Let's stop now. the poll. Yeah. Perfect. We're sharing the poll now. So you can see the results right there. As I'm kind of expecting, as I'm going to you see on the screen as I'm sharing, you see about um, that 20 to 30% has that 32% around. So you see that I say between 20 and maybe if we push the 40% is where the average interaction is. Um, I'm going to close that poll out of there. So we see this data. You're reaching maybe 20 to 30% of your students. Kind of what I was expecting there, as you see with that first third bullet point, 25 to 35%-ish really use the career services and the resources that are there. We know going in, it's about a one to 1,700 ratio from career staff to students. So let me go back to that first crazy example I, I shared where we talked about buying a house. Imagine you going into an open house one real estate agent, and there's 1,700 people there. Now you can go through this house, 
and there might be flyers about the house and there might be paperwork here and there throughout the house. But when you pick up those flowers, and let's be real here, when you pick up those flyers about the house or about the information that someone puts out there, do you read it? I'm being very real with this. Do we read that data? Do we look at it? And are we getting the help we need? And I'm not saying we're doing anything wrong. I'm saying let's be blunt and real for a few moments. Budgets have been cut. We're being asked to service a thousand more students than we can manage possibly. We're only seeing a quarter of the students actually use the resources and come into the resources. Let me share a story of a study I did. I worked with 4.0 students in the last semester for graduating. Okay? Think about it for yourself. It's a 4.0 student. It's in the last semester before you graduate. I don't know about you, but to me, those are the students that I think are going to be most prepared. They're going to be ready. They've already got their internships done. They've got their resume all set up. They've had the career prep. They've done everything. To me, that who's what I think of that when I see 4.0 students. And I think that's what many of us would think of. 86% of them were completely overwhelmed and lost. They didn't know where to go. They knew there was a center on campus to help them. By the time sometimes they thought about going to the center, it's like, oh, it's too late. They can't go there now. Or they're already home. There are other responsibilities, other things going on. One student even told me, you know what? I might just stay here another year. Think about that. Think about what your tuition is. And all of a sudden, the student says, you know what? I maybe not graduate so I can do another year and get better prepared for my next stage, where I'm going to do next. This was a 4.0 student telling me that. They were overwhelmed. It's tough. I share this quote. I worked in admissions. When I was the VP of enrollment management, one of the biggest things I said is as a campus, we are all here together to serve the goal of these students. And so, yes, we made our admissions goal, we made our numbers wonderful, but it wasn't about the admissions staff. It was about everyone else on campus that participated and did the work. It was how the faculty got involved, how student services got involved. It was about how we all worked together to help these students. It was no longer a silo, it was togetherness that brought it together. And that's a key to true student success. Working together and collaborating as much as possible. Because I know all the data at most of these colleges and where we are, that data comes right back to you. They say, okay, you're the director of career services. You're in career development. Tell me what the placement rate is. Tell me how we're putting these people together and getting them jobs. Tell me where they're working. Okay, I get it. I've had those questions asked to me and I had to kind of ask those questions too. So I get it. That's what the higher ups want to see. And they think, it's just a career service initiative, but it's campus-wide. So going back to that study, I told you 86% were overwhelmed. The others had no worries whatsoever about the next stage after they graduated. And this was a shocking thing that I found from that, or the two of them. This is one of them. Every single person who felt calm and ready and prepared to land that job or to go on and continue their education, whatever they chose to do, had the same thing in common. Within that first semester, or even before the first semester, they were advised 
and how to prepare themselves to graduate and be ready to move on. They were prepared by someone. Sometimes it was someone in career. Sometimes it was someone in admissions. Sometimes it was one of their advisors. But it was always someone at the school that was able to meet with them and take that time and put them on the plan. They sat down with them. One thing I heard greatly from them is anytime they met with someone, particularly their faculty advisor, all they wanted from their faculty advisor, besides for telling them the courses to do, is they expected that faculty advisor or that faculty member to give them the information they needed for the preparation to move on. So they didn't expect career services to provide the information. They expected the faculty member or the advisor to provide this information. Now, they would have been extremely happy if the advisor had said, hey, where are you with your career preparation? Have you met with a counselor or a coach or an advisor in the career center? And then sent them down there, sent them, copied them to an email, brought them to that office based on the size of the school and where it's everything located. They would have been perfectly happy with that. But that was missing for all these students that were overwhelmed. No one was saying, let me help you get there. Because we know we, hand-holding is happening a lot with this generation that's coming up. These students rely not on the career services office, but they rely on the faculty, the academic advisors, and other students to get this information. They really do. And so let me go on to a couple of things here as we get past this. Let's put up the next survey. I want to put this up, this, this survey as we come up. But individuals, they're more likely to see environments where there are established and clear high expectations for success. These expectations for success is the big thing. Uh, and so as Meredith is getting the next survey to come up and she can bring it up when she's ready, there we go. Uh, the more clear we are, the more expectations we put out there and they are known by the students, the more likely success happens. And so putting this question up there, just for my curiosity, I'd like to see where, what we do with this. So what campus initiatives do, do you do? Do your campus help create, to create early participation in career services resources? I love this up here. I love that first one, seeing a 75% at orientation. To me, that melts my heart. I love seeing that going up there as I'm seeing this data come in, but choose the one you want. Orientation, first year experience, I know there's others. There's a lot of initiatives we can do. Uh, but let, let's stop the poll here and we can share the results and see where we're at. You can see what that, right there, orientation, first year experience, wonderful. They are perfect. Those are great things to do. Um, Everyone's really starting to know that. The group would want to know if none is an option as well. You know what? I probably should have put none as one of the options. <laughs> you know, that's my, I, I thought too much that we always did something. So none might be one of the options. Uh, and if there is none, Maybe we need to talk, uh, but yeah, each school is different. And, I, and you know, sometimes you, I, even I forget about some of those options. So none, let's put up there, let's say there's some percentage to put none as well. But you can see up there, that orientation, first year experience, obviously big ones that they'd be doing. Then we get down a little bit more, see the requirements of like an entry level class, first semester advising, mentoring, then some other things are out there. So thank you for putting up the pair, uh, the, uh, Pull up there and taking the, the results with that. Orientation, I wanna talk about this a little bit. I wanna share something that was really crazy. I'm gonna share this neat idea that came out of this. Maybe 10, 12 years ago, I was recruiting. And I went to the community college that I was recruiting at. And I said to the advisor there, the career coach actually, she was director of career services. I go, why don't you invite me to your orientation? She gave me a funny look. These students are starting with them. Why would they invite me to come to it? And I said, just trust me. Invite me. Invite these are three other people from these schools. You know us. We know we're not here to steal your students. But what we want to do is help them now see the potential 
So I went to that orientation. I participated. I met with students all about what to do to get ready. I remember it was a year later. I'm in my office. And all of a sudden, down the hallway, now I was in the administration building. The president, the VPs were all right above me. All of a sudden, I hear this old man with this, oh, this gruffy voice. Oh, where's Thomas at? I need to talk to him. He's yelling this down the hallway. Now, imagine the president's right above me. The VPs are all right there. He's yelling this down the hallway. I'm in the far corner. So I get up and I know exactly who it is. So I go down the hallway and there's Phil. Wonderful guy. I love him. And he's standing there in the hallway with the student that I advised a year earlier. He looks at me and he looks at this piece of paper and he goes, did you do this? Did, did, you, did you put this together for her? I go, yeah, we, we put this together. He goes, I've never seen a plan that so well ever before. He was shocked. That student not only was able to do what she did, but graduated early from the community college, started with us, and was on a perfect plan. She was all prepared to go for it. But I had to think outside the box. Took that preparation of not just showing them how to use the system, but guiding them. So I say this right now and say, what can you do? Next up, what employers can you invite to orientation? Think about that differently. If there's an orientation, you have a little job fair at the orientation. It might not be to get a job right now, but if we know 88% of the students are coming to college to get a job, we know they're choosing the school because of the academic outcomes. Why not start them right up the first day they're there saying, hey, by the way, these are some of our key employers. They might give you some great advice of what you should be doing over these next two to four years or five years, whatever plan they're on. To help them out. And you know what? I'll do respect to everyone on there. I know this very well. Students, they never wanted to talk to me. Why would they want to talk to me? But the employer's there. Someone that they're looking for for the future is there. They're going to talk to them. They're going to have those conversations if they're there. But introduce not just the resources. Introduce the other ways for them to see the excitement, to see this is what can be the potential, to help prepare them and see why they need that preparation. We know how it is. You're going to a four-year school. I've got four years to wait. Three and a half years later, you're overwhelmed. So these need to be starting at day one. The career prep, the first year experience, of course, I see a lot of schools, you saw that, you know, what, 50 to 60% of the schools are using the FYE first year seminar course. Wonderful, this is great. But is it for one class? Or is it a regular thing where they're going into whatever your CSM is? I know there's lots of CSMs out there. I know the popular ones, the popular ones, whatever CMSM, your job boards, resources you have, is, are they actually getting in there and talking to someone? Are they having to go in that platform and do something? And I love this when I saw, and I talked to some of these schools, and we did this with their intro, like psych, intro psych courses, introduction to English, criminal justice. In, introduction to English was a great one to do this in. Write a resume of the first semester. And you got to upload it into whatever system you're using. How simple is that to get that participation up there, get them familiar with them right away? Thomas, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to jump in because we have um, a couple comments just pertinent to our yeah, discussion. Yeah, please do. Here. So, yeah. So we've stopped participating in orientation. Students are overwhelmed with information overload. We focus on presentations in two first, first year required courses. That was one comment. Yep. Um, another, Julie and I just typing the same thing. <laughs> orientation has way too much going on at our institutions. So we have our career team get into the University 101 courses. We have for a career center overview presentation. And Absolutely. One one more, a newbie here, former academic advisor. Plan is to participate in advising part of orientation, and we already present at college adjustment first year courses. Thanks, Thomas. Absolutely. And I completely understand because one of the next things I was going to say is what we teach at orientation is lost by the time you start the first day of class. It really is because of those three comments right there, it's all lost. And that's what brings into that, bringing into the first year experience course as well bring it into those one-on-one -on -one courses because it does, you, they're hundred percent right. And that's why we had to do it where I was at. We had to bring it, not just from the first class, but we had to bring it to the early classes and the intro classes because that just added, it 
gave that remembrance of what was taught. Because we look at the data, they only remember where their buildings are, where they're going for classes, and the friends they made. Truly, and there's a lot of information in there. So you have the orientation. Hence, I gave that idea also of putting the employer there, something different to stand out a little bit to just show those connections. But the first year experience classes, absolutely. The more you can do in those, the better they are, uh, whether it's a presentation, but the more, especially in that, the more it can be done. Once again, 88% of the students are coming here for the career. This data, and we know, and we know you're short staffed, it stays important. And the next step is really gonna get you the, the key with this. The introduction 101 courses, how can you get the faculty involved with those 101, 100 level courses? And I was a psych major. I had no idea what to do. I was gonna do with psychology. I thought, what, I gotta be a psychologist? But what if in the intro to psychology class, which most students have to take a lot of schools, they had to go into the job board and find a job that met, said psychology could be a major for. I bet you would find a lot of different ones. The criminal justice could be a major for. What if they had to go and look in the guidebooks, what you can do with psychology degrees, what you can do with career, uh, with criminal justice or English or whatever degree you want. What if that was part of those 101 courses, especially for the students that don't know what their major is gonna be? If the faculty bought in and got them looking right away in those courses, in those professions, they might find something very interesting to them. They might actually say, this might be the major for me because the career outcome is matching what I wanna do. I want to say, I'm gonna go back here to that house story again. I'm gonna go back here to something I taught in a couple of different presentations I've done nationally. Students speak a different language than faculty, staff, and administration. So what we say as administrators, they have different language and they don't know it. When they come to college, they are truly entering a brand new world they've never been in before. We live here, we're the natives. They're the aliens coming in. And so even knowing where career service is located, you can show them an orientation. You gotta show them again in first year experimenter. You gotta show them again in those intro courses every year. They need to be taught this. They need to be shown this because they are not like us. They don't know what all this means. They're just here trying to tread water, go forward, enjoy this experience, but they want that job. And so we need to make sure we understand their language and perceptions are different than what we are. Because we offer, I know we offer all these services. We know we do our best to get them out there, but how can we get them in their language and connect with them? And this is what's going to meet to the, the next real point, which I know is a stickling point. I, I know I say this sometimes, and the looks I get from people, trust me, I get it. One job, I was very fortunate that across the street from me was the chair of the faculty senate. And so I needed, had initiatives and things we needed to pass. We would literally meet in the middle of the street and one of our driveways and have impromptu conversations because I knew the faculty had a big sway in that school. And I knew the faculty always have a big sway and they're, they're important and they're more important than we can imagine. Faculty and the academic resources and sides are the biggest indicator and predictor and influence on retention and success. The relationships between the faculty and the students are huge. They really are. And guess what? Just like students, faculty are kind of aliens to the career side too. We don't think of it that way, but they are. Just like we have to teach an orientation, this is what we need to do. We need to do the same with faculty. Remind them, teach them, we need to get that champion, we need to find that champion that can really get them involved because if they get involved, you see the engagement greatly increase. You see the usage of any system we have greatly increase because that's what happens. Because the students, I said in my, my own study, I've seen in all the research, the students trust the faculty, their advice and what they're saying to do. And so with that, how we can use faculty is gonna be a big thing on any campus. 
even if it is as simple as reminding them where we are, reminding them how we can help them and go forward. And I, and I see this. I know I, I visit a lot of career services and sites. I see they have faculty engagement, how faculty and staff can help on their website. We also know they're very busy. We know that. And so once again, the burden always falls back on career services. I get that completely. I do. But the more we get the faculty involved, and I'll give you an example. When I was in the Roman side again, we would invite the faculty to our planning. Got the different heads, various people from the faculty departments, we invited them to our planning. So they got involved and they were now part of our annual planning, our, our career fair, our events, the activities we were going to do. They were key faculty members, part of those discussions. One, we wanted them part of the discussion, but two was the real reason, the secret reason we wanted them fully bought in to what we were doing. It's tough to get that, but when they bought in, they brought it back to their own departments with some energy. Like, look at this. And I changed this, and especially if you want, they wanted something changed. If they feel like they made that change, they bring it back to their department with, look, I got the time change, it was more, more convenient for us or whatever it is. They then brought their students there. They were more enthused about it. I know there's a lot of committees, but getting those faculty onto our planning. And yeah, we had to bribe them too. We gave them lunch. Okay, we know food sells. We had to bribe them too, but it was simple things like that we did to get them involved, get that buy-in on the planning stage, but then helped out when it came to the implementation of everything we did. The other thing that is a real key resource, your alumni. I remember talking to students. One of their biggest hurdles they didn't realize or didn't know that someone like themselves could succeed. Everyone thinks they're unique and individualistic and that there's no one else like them out there. Just like every college, you know, without a respect, every college thinks they're unique. And there's no other college like them out there. Every college is unique. Every person is unique, but we're all very similar. One of the challenges these students thought was, did someone actually do this? Did someone go through this program and get this type of job? Is someone working here? Who can I talk to? And, you know, is someone succeeding a year after graduating, two years after graduating? That's where our alumni is very important. I see on this many campuses as well, this disconnect. And if you're working with your alumni office in a great way, that is phenomenal. If you're working faculty in a great way, phenomenal. Kudos to you. That is a great thing. Do more presentations about that. Share how you got these interactions happening. Those are the things we need to know. Those are the things that other schools need to see. But there's always a disconnect between this alumni and, and career as well, because they are doing their different things. But it's those alumni are so key. So the students can see, oh, look, this person wasn't my major. This person, two years after graduating, is doing a job in this field or doing this job here, and they can move to this, move to this field. They need to see those experiences. They need to know that and know how they can work and help them out. So they can say to themselves, I can do this because someone else has come through and has done this too. So the faculty we have on campus, extremely vital, extremely vital. And the alumni, they're not on campus anymore, but they show the success. And especially those young alumni who might not have the money to donate yet, they can give their time. And they're more than willing, especially one, two, three years out. They still have that pride for that school. They were just there. They're still willing to give that time and give back in the, whatever it is in the feedback and help out students in a different way so they can feel that pride. And once again, they help out that way. They see the pride. They're going to help out longer. Going back to the, giving the donations back and being the lifelong supporter of the school. So what are some of the resources? What are some of the ways to address this gap that we saw, that 30% gap? Let's start with the faculty. Get them involved. Get involved with their planning. I mentioned that it's a big thing. But really, as much as we can do, sharing them the resources that you have, letting them know the resources that are there. If you have like that career knowledge, you know, I, I'll, I'll talk here, you know, I work, I do work for firsthand. I guess I should talk some about firsthand and, and vault. You know, I know in vault, for example, we have the professions, the guidebooks, the industries, all in this one stop spot, one stop where they can easily click on any major. But if the faculty know these are there, the students know they're there, especially the faculty, and they can say in their classes, hey, go here for this guidebook on this ma major. You don't want to be an architect. Here's a guidebook on this major with all these different jobs in there. You're looking to go into the criminal justice field. Here's the industry of criminal justice. Here's all the possibilities, the outlook for that. 
the career focus for that. Because a lot of times they think, oh, I'm going to be in criminal justice, I need to be a cop. Well, if you have these resources there, they can see other options. Yes, you can Google search all this, but I tell you what, you Google search criminal justice, you're probably going to get 100 other schools to transfer to as the first results. That's why something like this, these, these platforms that are there, they have all this data together, these resources are great. The career prep stuff, the mock interviews, the um, finding out who the employers are and what it's like to work in these places, articles, videos. The faculty, they need to be spoons fed the information just like the students do. We saw the 25% engagement, maybe 30% in some schools. The engagement happens because the students are looking for it and happen to find the right, stumble at the right spot. Those 75% don't know where to look and haven't been given the instruction. And a lot of it starts with the faculty. Faculty says, hey, you need to look at this article. Look at this video. So the faculty, they can be engaged first. They can get in there first. They can now share this information out with the students. When they share it out with the students, the students now, almost because it's not assignment, but it's almost like an assignment, they're then obligated, at least internally, they feel obligated to go there. And then this can open the door for you to come in and give them even more advice and more success. Other thing here, early involvement with winning outcomes, the alumni. I've seen the blogs out there. Blogs are great. The video blogs are great too. How the alumni can be out there and go in there. You know, one thing that I've seen we've done with firsthand, I've seen a couple of schools I've worked with done, is it's like in the know job boards. Many people have, many schools have these job boards. And these job boards have hundreds of thousands of jobs in there from all over the country. That alone is overwhelming for these students. But how can you have an in the know job board? You know, for example, one thing we do with firsthand is we invite the alumni into the platform to post jobs. And so with our unique job board that we have, now, most of all the schools we work with have another job board through other companies, which is great. That's a big, massive job board. But in the unique one, the alumni can come in and they then post the jobs and then they're connected to the jobs. Neat thing about that is the students can see this alumni is connected to the job. They can reach out to their alumni in like a mentoring capacity and say, hey, let's have a conversation about this job. Now when they're searching this job where they know every single job in here is an in the know job, it's a connected job. Someone connected to the school has posted this job and is willing to talk to them about that job. Chances are that's not an HR recruiter. It's an alumnus or someone else like that. And now they reach out to that person. That person now can refer that student for the job or that student to be alumnus for the job or internship. And that student can apply for the job with the information provided by that alumnus. So it's a neat way of one, referrals. We know what's going on in the job market. They're, they're searching for jobs. The referral program has been increased at many schools. So alumni get a little bonus. They feel proud for that being a bonus for referring someone. They're also connecting to the school. They're being there as an option for the students. And it's a unique way of putting a job board out there. It's a little different than the mass jobs that we see with all the job boards we have. It really personalizes and connects it. Mentoring. Alumni that can be available to just have conversations. But once again, more than that, I go back to they just want to know they can succeed. Like, for example, with our mentoring platform, when they look up a student and look up a mentor that's matched to them, they can see where they've been working. That alone has so much power to it because they're seeing, look at all these alumni here. Look where they're working, the field they're in. They graduated from my school and they're doing this job. That alone is huge because that's a missing piece. They want to see that success. And they want to see, oh, this person looks like me, has the same background as me, and they can find them through that. Even seeing this at schools, don't think just alumni when it comes to mentoring. Seniors, juniors, within departments, within the school of business, you've got incoming students, you've got seniors, put them together in a mentoring capacity. It creates that bond. Once again, it's the faculty side that helps this. It's the academic side that creates these bonds because that's where they can bring them to the platforms. So if you've got people that are seniors that can help out with this, those are great things. I, at my school and another school I went to, we did this for all freshmen coming in. They were all assigned mentors their first year. And they weren't necessarily faculty. They weren't faculty. We said no faculty. It was staff and upperclassmen were allowed to be these mentors. So that helped them adjust. But once again, now go to the career side. We know they have an 88% chance. They want the job. They want the job. This gets it early on and connects them with them. And you can do the same with employers. Instead of bringing employers orientation, you can bring employers this way too. Let them be a resource for you because we know you are spread thin to begin with. 
You have 1,700 to one ratios on average. You're being told to run all these reports, get all this data, and be told to meet with all these students, and they can't meet with you one-on-one. -on -one. But you have these resources on your campus that are there for you that we often don't take advantage of because we don't think about taking advantage of them. And some schools do. I'm not saying because some schools do. They are there for you. They're there to help you. But you got to give them that, those tools. And once again, give them the tools and give them the tools. That's a big thing. They need to know and be reminded that the tools are there because these students are aliens to our schools. They're coming here now needing to find a job, but we don't talk to them. They don't think about finding a job to their last semester. They're lost, just like someone walking into an open house, not knowing how to get a house. They're lost the same way. But it's entirely, they don't know how to get the job. They don't. They just, so they got to get a resume and a cover letter. Well, if someone's been working with Career Center at any school from their freshman year on, and they've been polishing and practicing, getting all that stuff, that person's going to be much more prepared to make that best offer for that job. So we want to make sure our students are the best prepared, making that offer for that job. So I thank you for, for listening to me. Um, at this point, I know we have some questions. If we do, I'm glad to take any questions that are out there. Uh, feel free to put them in, in the question box. Um, if you have any other thoughts. Um, so well. Jump right in. We had a few comments I want to address um, before we get to questions. So what's in just the points that you just made. So what's interesting about this point about most vital resources, don't underestimate the connection that faculty have with alumni. Um, another comment. So mm -hmm. we have resources that faculty can, can access, but most of the time they seem to want a one, a one shot presentation to cover everything. So we are trying to create online class modules that faculty can use or take to understand how it works. Yes. Um, Cindy, great point that reminds me of what we do here at the University of Rhode Island. We had received a grant to have folks help us develop these professional development modules that some faculty at our institution use in their course assignment as assignments. And they provide a web link there. So thank you for that. Um, thank you for the resource. Feel free to use. If anyone wants to chat about how we use modules, they can privately message. So we just have a few things. So let's go ahead and get to Q&A. We do have a question from Jen. Maybe and this was posted some time ago. So maybe this is outside of the scope of this topic. But Thomas, can, um, can you address how can employers help with this? How can we find these kids to interview and potentially hire on? And I'll post that into the chat now. That's, that's a great question, uh, and it, it, it's, it's always a challenging one. Saying it, I'm going to say it the blunt way. The employers have the clout. They do. In the students' eyes, they do. And so it's, if they're there on campus and they're connected to you, the students are going to be more receptive, especially when they see them. Uh, at a, a certain events and thinking them outside the box, how you can bring them on. Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a big thing. My first starting point, and I talk with a couple of schools, an idea we brought out uh, last year, we, we implemented. And, I, and I, I, I'm sharing this because I was at a NACE conference uh, symposium, maybe before, it was a year before uh, COVID hit maybe. And the employers there were all saying to me, we've been instructed to not go to career fairs anymore, to limit them. And then COVID hit and things completely changed. And we saw within the NACE, NACE, the stats that were done, the participation at these events has actually been down, the virtual events than they were in person. But the trend was already happening. The employers were already saying, yeah, we can't go out of these events. So a lot of those schools I worked with are smaller schools. What their first initiative was, was they reached out to these employers and said, really, let's do a two minute interview. Where I'm gonna give you two minutes, I'm gonna record the session, and I'm gonna let you do your two minute elevator pitch of why it's great to work there. That was the starting point for them to get those employers interested. Oh, that's all I have to do with two minute interview, and I don't have to do anything else, and you're gonna freely market it. Now, some schools said, we're gonna charge you like a sponsorship to get this. That was, then they started this Employer of the Week, Employer of the Month, and every week they had these videos, and they had a whole collection of all these employer videos that they had. 
and the resources were there that they can then share with the students. And then that got them more interested in the specific companies. And as the likes increased, they were able to then say, hey, you've gotten 50 likes in your video. Why don't you come to campus now? So it gave the employer the count, hey, people are really interested in you. They've seen your video, did a great job. Come back here on campus. And now it was able to, even more marketed, they were more familiar with them. And the time was much more valuable for all of them. So that's a, that was one way we did that. But it's the feeder, the feeder employers, I would say, are the best ones for those other events you want to do. If you have those couple of feeder employers that are always talking to you, are always there, bring them on for some of those things just to show when you have students there. It says a lot to the students, hey, we're serious about your success, your jobs. And here's some of the employers that we know we want to bring on. If you can have a little conversation with now to see where your potential could be. Um, did that answer the question for you? Thank you, Thomas. We have another one. What is the best way to partner with an employer? That's a tough one, especially now. Uh, I'm going to go back to the, the question I just said. Think about what the employers, where they're at, and how you can best handle them. Because the truth is, once again, just like you're wearing multiple hats, nowadays, especially with everything that's going on, they're wearing multiple hats, and they were instructed years, few years ago to limit their off-campus recruitment physically. And so doing what you can to make it easier for them. I'm gonna go back to that video idea that has worked really well for the schools that put it in. Simple things, and then the schools have their own YouTube channel, where they had, the, they, for example, if they had firsthand, they were able to upload those videos into firsthand and code them as the employer and see employer videos. And so that was a big thing to allow them to get that little extra stuff for the employers that was personal to them. And then, from there, they were able to go on that with that. So it's thinking outside the box. It's it's tough. You got to think outside the box to connect with them, so it's easy for them, easy for you. And once that connection is made, they're able to you know see the results and the results improve. You can bring them on to the next day and say and say, hey, we've had these great connections, we've had these great views. Let's go forward with this. Um, the other thing I've seen some schools do has have success with was those employers of the month employers of the week, where they really promoted them throughout campus. Once again, an engagement has to be there. Going back to also, what was mentioned in one of the comments, faculty and alumni relationships are phenomenal. They're two vital resources and they are connected because it goes back to the students connect with the faculty more than anyone else on campus. And so they have great relationships. There are a lot of departments that have really great faculty employer relationships too. And so as soon as you get that faculty involved and you get that buy-in from them, which is not easy. We, I know that. But when you, you can get that and put that time and get that done, you'll open up more alumni connections into the platform and new employer connections. Because there are also those faculty that are like, I own these employers. I'm not going to give them away. Well, if you can the, create that connection with the, the faculty and show them how we're not looking to steal your, them from you, we're looking to make it a better process for them to connect with our students and with you, it changes. It changes the mindset. Any other questions? Yes, we have our last question of the session. And that is, are you presuming that participation is the same as engagement? That is a tough question. Or the sharing <laughs> of resources. And that will be the last question. Thomas. Right, that is a tough one. It goes down to the personal preference when it comes to engagement. Engagement can be in person. Engagement can be they're just clicking on the resource each school has their own definition of what engagement is. And so I'm not going to put the definition of what it should be. To me, I'll say, and when I speak of engagement, it's a very broad statement because it can be, these are people we've had one-on-one -on -one conversations with, we know we've talked with, and it can be the fact that, hey, somehow they got into our platform, they started using the resources and we know they have. And so we can see that, we can track the data, the usage. So they've engaged with us in some way. Uh, in some capacity. So it doesn't always have to be that one-on-one, -on -one, but each school does their own engagement their own way. To me, when I was calling these stats, it was always about the total encompassing, everything we offer. Is someone to have a touch point here, there, there? Where were these touch points um, within the career, the career center, the services we have to offer, the mentoring, the resources, the books we had? Where were these connections and how many users did we have with that to engage with us? Because they can't, and it was very blunt in the studies I've done and seen so many students, they thought about it at 10 o'clock at night, 11 o'clock at night. 
like, oh, shoot, I wanted to stop by career services. I wanted to get this information. But they go through classes and they go through stuff and they're just lost, especially if you're at uh, community colleges or you're working with adult students. They're not in, nonstop going. And so they don't think about some of the stuff until the end. And that's where having those platforms and those resources available so they can go on their phone and say, oh, look, I need to connect here and connect that and get that engagement. And that's where it's really expanded, increased in engagement for everything. So with that, I know that was the last question. I'm, I'm humbled and grateful for everyone uh, spending time this afternoon with me or morning for some of you. Um, you know, you see my contact information right there. If you want any questions, you want to continue the discussion, feel free to reach out to me uh, via my uh, email or, or send, send me a text message, whatever's easier. If you are interested in learning more about some of the stuff I talk about firsthand with the mentoring or the in the no job board or some of our resources we have with Vault, I'm more than willing to talk about that as well. But I love the space. I, I love data and stats and presenting like this. So I'm grateful and I'm truly humbled to be, be a part of this event today. So I thank you very much. And uh, Meredith, are there any other questions or uh, thoughts before we end today? No, you can go ahead and close. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. You guys have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, Dr. Thomas Iwinko and First Hand, an info-based company for a very informative session. And thank you participants for attending today's webinar. The archive along with step-by-step -step instructions on how to receive these items will be made available within three to five business days. Please note that the PowerPoint presentation will be made available following today's webinar. We would like to thank you for attending today's session. This officially concludes the webinar and you may now sign off.